exactly short of things to talk about. I, I reflected yesterday morning on the number of times since Boris Johnson became mayor of London in 2008. We, on this programme, which of course was confined to London back in 2008, how many times we have wondered together whether or not this is the end of the road for one of the most uh, appalling people ever to hold public office in the history of these islands. And we have also dedicated a significant number of hours together to the question of how does he keep getting away with it? How does he continue to get away with behaviours, proven behaviours, that were, would have ended pretty much any other career? And, and he doesn't just get away with it once or twice, he seems to be getting away with it lately on an almost monthly basis. But something broke yesterday, something snapped. The, the, the sort of tension that had grown over the latest lie, the lie over the appointment of Christopher Pincher as Deputy Chief Whip and the lie that he hadn't known about allegations facing him and then the shift to claims that he hadn't known about specific allegations and then the shift to claims that the allegations he had known about were unsubstantiated or unsubstantiated as that ridiculous individual Michael Ellis kept saying in the House of Commons yesterday. Uh, and that all fell apart after Simon MacDonald published his letter, the launch pad for two hours of yesterday's programme. And then today we find ourselves starting the programme at 10 o'clock in the morning with 13 resignations from government, some big, they don't get bigger than Chancellor of the Exchequer, some small, um, you know, PPSs, and plenty in between. I think an exodus that is unprecedented, I could be wrong, I, I don't remember it ever being necessary because, of course, the attrition would normally have prompted a Premier to fall upon their sword. The resignation of a Chancellor of the Exchequer and a Secretary of State for Health followed by 11 more resignations from government. I mean, it's the moment, you remember probably the best line in recent months about Boris Johnson is that traditionally the Chief Whip takes a metaphorical revolver and glass of whiskey into the Prime Minister's office and expects him to do um, what's best for the country, but in Boris Johnson's case, he'd drink the whiskey and shoot the chief whip. And, and I, I think, although it's a, a metaphor, it's a, it's a telling one. Um, so what do we talk about today? We can't do another conversation about how he keeps getting away with it, because I think finally it looks as if he has run out of road. I, I, I don't know if I've said to you before, I truly think this is, this is it. Special shout out to Lee, who, who says, 2008, James, that's scary. <laughs> this is my longest relationship ever. <laughs> we should have a little anniversary party, Lee, to celebrate, shouldn't we? But um, I don't think that's the question to ask today. I, and I also am conscious of you not being as immersed in the world of politics as perhaps some of us are. So I, I, I want to keep it interesting for you. I don't know how much sympathy I can muster up for people who are feeling betrayed and let down. Certainly if you've been kind enough to listen to this programme over the last few years and you're sort of mourning this morning your uh, previous regard for Boris Johnson, I certainly won't be nasty or mean to you, but what the hell have you been doing for that? I mean, where where has your head been? Up your backside? Honestly, how can anybody be remotely surprised by what has transpired? And that, I think, is the way into our contemplations this morning. It, it, not, not such a crass question, how can anybody be remotely surprised by this? But those of us who have been pointing out the inevitability of collapse because when an administration is built upon lies it is built upon nonsense it is built upon vanity then it will fall apart the only question is when and how much damage will be done in the process and in the interim you you cannot sustain indefinitely any project built upon a platform of lies and this project is, of course, built upon, A, the lies of Brexit, which many people who are finally falling out of love with Boris Johnson are still not ready to let go of, and B, the lies that essentially embody Boris Johnson, the utter dishonesty that runs to the man's very core, the refusal to accept that we all need to be part of the network of obligations that bind us all, the absolutely pathological rejection of anything that remotely resembles empathy or concern, compassion or community. It's incredible that he has been propelled to the highest office in the land, despite being so summarily unfit for even the lowest office in the land, whatever that might be. 
I, 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 I still find it staggering, and I have been talking about it for 14 years. Pretty much, what, about a month after that mayoral election, when the scales fell from my eyes at breakneck speed, and I've spent the um, ensuing decade and a half wondering why the hell you can't see how naked this particular emperor is. And here we are today. Here we are today. The emperor is naked. Rishi Sunak has finally acknowledged that the emperor is naked. Sajid Javid has finally acknowledged that the emperor is naked. And yet, days ago, they were sitting next to him, grinning like Cheshire cats and nodding along like, well, nodding dogs. As he attempted to lie his way out of trouble again, they didn't resign over the parties. Rishi Sunak didn't resign after getting fined. They didn't resign over the uh, apology from the official spokesman for lying to the people, because when they lie to the press, they lie to the people about the parties. They didn't resign over the uh, failure to keep infected people out of care homes during the first wave of COVID. They didn't resign over the death toll that was a direct consequence of that. They didn't resign after he failed to turn up to five COBRA meetings at the beginning of the biggest health crisis this country has ever faced. They didn't resign over that. They didn't resign over the personal life issues that would have seen many other politicians heading for the exit door without any prospect of a return ticket. They didn't resign over any of these things. Why did they resign over this? Why did he resign over this? Why is it this lie that has focused the minds of these people? That's the question I've got for you at 10 past 10 this morning. Why do you think it is this lie at this time? You know figures of speech or cliches or proverbs or whatever we should properly call them. And you use them and you sort of know what they mean, but you don't really know what they mean. I, I last week rather embarrassingly discovered that I'd been misusing the phrase Streisand effect for most of my adult life. I didn't think it meant what it does actually mean. It means trying to keep something out of the news and actually drawing a hell of a lot more attention to it as a result of keeping it out of the news than it would ever have received if you just allowed it to appear in the news. But the, the, the simple phrase, the straw that broke the camel's back... The straw that broke the camel's back. How many times have you used that phrase without properly wondering about what it means? Because what it means, of course, is that the thing that actually breaks the back doesn't have to be particularly big or heavy. I mean, the heavier the straw, the more likely it is to be the one that breaks the camel's back. But it's about an accumulation, isn't it? A concentration of mass that finally becomes unsustainable. So why is this the straw that has broken this, has probably broken this particular back? I'm going to open up the phone lines now for that question. Why this lie? Why is this the one that's seen them heading for the exit door? 0345 6060 973. And within the bounds of Ofcom regulations and common decency, you can be as rude as you want today about this shower because I've had enough of uh, bending over backwards to retain some semblance of uh, or normality and decency. We, we blew it. We've all blown it. We've all made the mistake that the American media made with Donald Trump by thinking that we'll carry on abiding by the network of obligations that binds us all. We'll carry on talking as if this is just a, um, a, a, an extremity within the parameters of normality. It's not. The parameters of normality were left behind years ago. In fact, in Boris Johnson's case, it's it's arguable that the parameters of normality or common decency have ever been in place at all. The man's monstrous in his corruption, utterly depraved in his political conduct, and it is the country that will pay the price for generations to come, because while you may not be personally ready to admit it yet, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait until Brexit really begins to bite. You heard what the pound is today, a dollar nineteen for the pound? You think that fuel prices would be as high as they were if we hadn't deliberately tanked the pound under the guise of a Jacob Rees-Mogg flavoured economic revolution. It's, it's nuts what's on the horizon, whoever is in charge. And, of course, that opens up the other question, which I'll move on to probably. The phone lines have gone understandably bonkers already. But I am interested in what this does to your perception of politics in general. Because I was having a conversation yesterday... It was it was off the record, but with someone who you, you, you know and someone who has been following these matters for longer than some of us have been alive. And that 
desperate and disgusting effort by the Daily Mail to resurrect the so-called beer gate story, which may yet do for Keir Starmer. That is part of a really ugly and deliberate program of, of gaslighting or brainwashing. What they are desperate to achieve, the people that put Boris Johnson in Downing Street, the people that sold Brexit to a desperate nation, are desperate now, absolutely desperate, to absolve themselves of responsibility for the carnage, both literal carnage in the case of coronavirus and metaphorical carnage in the case of the economy and the labour market and the rest of it and the pound and the currency. They have to create in, a, in your mind the idea that they're all as bad as each other. I mean, how pathetic was it to pretend that one post or, or, or in-work meal undertaken by the leader of the opposition was somehow a counterbalance to the catalogue of carousing that was unfolding at Downing Street. Friday night wine times, pools of vomit being cleared up by minimum wage cleaners, garden swings being broken, karaoke machines being brought in. The, the idea that one meal was in any way comparable to that was nonsense. But after two weeks of front pages, they turn it into a story. It becomes a story. Three, four days into those front pages, the BBC has to start reporting it because such is the heft of the Daily Mail still in this country that they actually get to decide what's news and what isn't. Even to the point where a police force falls into line behind the ludicrous, biased rhetoric of a newspaper owned by a Viscount. So that's what's going to happen next. Even if Johnson goes, the efforts that were put into putting him into power, the people that undertook that project will put their next efforts into persuading everybody that they're all as bad as each other because otherwise they're culpable, they're guilty, they're responsible for the unfolding mess. Murdoch, Barclay, Harmsworth, on it goes. And they've turned on him now, which means the next stage of their project of self-protection, self-promotion and self-enrichment will be to pretend that the disaster Boris Johnson has proven to be had absolutely nothing to do with them. So question number one, why this lie? Why now? 0345 6060973. Why has this particular straw broken those particular backs of these camels or politicians, members of government? And the second question, which we'll move on to a little later, I think, is what, what does this do for you? I, I mean, I know I say this occasionally, but, and I mean it, and I know it sounds stupid, but I do really, really mean it. People who don't really ring radio phone in, people who don't ring radio stations, people who don't ring in. I know a lot of, I mean, the huge majority of people who listen would never dream of ringing in. I'm fascinated to know what your attitude to politics is, or how it's being changed by recent events, whether it's been changed at all, how this has damaged younger people's understanding of the importance of parliament and the role of politics i'm fascinated to know about that and we'll have a look at it a little later in the program but we begin with this after all the lies all the corruption all the disgusting unprecedented contact all the deliberate rejections of the network of obligations that binds us all why now for javid and for sunak and for Quince, and for Trot, and for, for, for nine other members of this government. Why now, when they were cheering him last week, what is it about the Christopher Pincher, Simon MacDonald story that has prompted this exodus? Because I'll tell you, it's nothing for nothing. If the vote of confidence was taking place tonight, he'd be toast. And another thing, the, the, the resignation letters, the ones that we've seen, um, they're not pretty because, no, she hasn't resigned, obviously, um, because they have to pretend or perhaps they still believe that they haven't spent the last three years hitched to a project of, of political depravity. They have to say things like, we, we got Brexit done or uh, I, I backed you to become leader of our party and have served as your chancellor with gratitude. Under your leadership, we broke the Brexit deadlock. And, and that, that's the problem here. They're still pretending that the platform upon which the administration was built isn't rancid and riddled with woodwork. Otherwise, in a sense, they denigrate themselves and, and their probably career highlight 
And that, that's ugly too. God, there's a lot to talk about. I should shut up and let someone else say something, shouldn't I? Connor is in Harrogate. Connor, what would you like to say? Morning, Jim. Hello, uh, this must be like Christmas morning for you, isn't well, it? Yes and no, you see. I mean, I, you, people often say this to me, and my response is a bit glib. It's very good for business. It's actually not very good for the soul. Connor, I, 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 I look forward to the days when we would have little choice but to talk about cycle lanes and parking tickets, but we are where we are. Yeah, no, so, so I, I agree with you to some extent, but I actually think you're, you're slightly missing what's happened here with, with the greatest of respect. Yes, of course. I don't, believe it, I don't believe it's the straw that, bro that has broke the camel's back for the country. I think what we're seeing here is the straw that's broke the camel's back for self-serving Tory MPs. Yes, I, no, no I, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't mean to suggest it was the country. When I said the camels, I meant Javid and Sunak and and and, uh, yeah. and Trot and Quince and the rest of them. Well, I think the situation that we found ourselves in is that the, the last vote of no confidence was effectively the very last. If you lie again, and if you put ourselves in a position where you keep lying, and our position starts to become untenable, that's it. You're out. And this is the way that he's backtracked through various different things with the Pincher scandal. That's been his final straw. That's been the final straw to say, you haven't learned, you're putting us in a position where we're going to lose our seats. We've seen that in the last set of by-elections, and we can no longer continue with you because we're going to lose our position. How, how, how old are you? 30. Ah, did you? I, it's an interesting age for the question I'm about to ask you, because I don't know the answer. Did you have those little evil Knievel toys when you were a kid? Uh, yeah. Well, then you turn the wheel really needle. quick. You, you turn the wheel yeah, really, yeah. really quickly, yeah. and then it shoots off at, at breakneck speed, yeah. and, and you can line up your dominoes or get your sister's dollies and do a jump over them like Evil Knievel. It's like that, isn't it? It's 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 because I think if there'd been a six-month hiatus between the vote of no confidence, the last one, and the Chris Pincher story, the wheel actually wouldn't have revved up quite as fast. It's because it came. So everyone's sitting there thinking, what's going to happen when the next scandal comes along? But actually, yeah. it's when the next scandal comes along that can be crucial, because that wheel is still moving pretty quickly. It's still cranked up from the vote of confidence, and then along comes Pincher. If there'd been a year or six months, I don't think we would have actually seen what we've seen in the last 12 hours. I completely agree. It's too, it's too fresh in the minds yeah. of people, and the, the, the Tory MPs are looking around and thinking, we've seen what's happened in the by-elections as well, which is another big part of the timing here, yes. and yes. Just, we, can't, we can't continue with him or we will lose our seats and we will, we will lose government. Here's a question I should have asked earlier, and thank you for prompting it, making me realise I should have asked it earlier. Do, do people like Javid and Sunak emerge with any honour by being the first to go? Or, or have they already sullied themselves too much by, by wallowing in the filth of Boris Johnson's administration for so long? I think they're scrabbling to try, and I, I thought mm. it was particularly interesting if you read Sunak's uh, resignation, that he made a comment, and I can't remember it verbatim, but something around, I've disagreed with you privately. Right. I think once he's toppled, if Sunak comes out and starts to say the things that he disagreed with Boris on, mm. that will be his play to try and stay in the ministerial position, potentially have a run for the leadership. Um, I, I think that's what we'll see next, but I've Quite possibly, sure, you know, yeah. he, he who wields the dagger never wears the crown, is, or, or, or some such phrase is probably my poor memory of Shakespeare, but you haven't answered my question. For you personally, do they, do either of them emerge with any integrity? No, no, not when you've been this close to it, not when you see him lie, not when you've seen the direction that he's taken politics in. He's brought it into disrepute in the country, and I think anyone who's been close or anywhere near his inner circle now uh, is, is dead politically for the next four plus years at least. I, uh, I have to tell you, Lee Anderson, of all people, Mr. Food Bank, has just called for Prime Minister Boris Johnson to resign. Um, Lee Anderson, of course, was a Labour councillor until not long ago. Thank you, Connor. The, the, far be it from me to jump to the defence of Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid or any of the others, but uh, 30p Lee has now jumped ship. It's the best way. Well, that's a great text. You should have signed it. You deserve credit for that. Is that what they call him? Is that what we call him? 30p Lee? Because he said you could feed families for, for 30p, didn't he, per meal? Um, look at look at Nadim Zahawi. Talk about the curse of O'Brien kicking in. Honestly, I said a few warm words about him three months ago, and since that moment, he's absolutely gone down the plug hole, hasn't he, reputationally? But look at Nadeem Zahawi. So when I suggest that Sunak and Javid might have accrued a modicum of integrity by behaving, albeit belatedly, in this fashion, and you say, no, 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 
I have to point out Nadeem Zahawi. So they've got to have a better claim towards integrity than Nadeem Zahawi has got. Nadeem Zahawi sold his soul live on television this morning. It was an incredible moment. I don't know if you saw it or, 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 or heard it. Sent out to do the interviews. And, uh, and, and essentially... Uh, concede it. I mean, well, you listen to it for yourself. Check this out. Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time, Mr Zahawi? Yes, I do, because I've worked with him when we delivered the vaccine programme. He wants us to publish that daily data, be transparent, to show people where, you know, we're not getting the vaccine through. I remember uh, a big headline saying in Tottenham. Okay, so uh, sorry, you've just reverted back to the vaccine program. Yeah, because which you're asking me now, about you're asking me about about, about the, transparency. Yeah, but, you're asking me about okay, about does so, the prime so minister believe in transparency? Because he was he transparent the, about the vaccine program, hmm. do you believe was he 100% honest about uh, the parties that went on? in Downing Street and in government during lockdown and was he 100% honest about what he knew about Chris Pincher? See, the reason I answered you about the vaccine is because you asked me about transparency. This Prime Minister believes in transparency. It's incredible because of course they lie about the vaccines <clears throat> as well. Susanna Rido once again leading the pack in, in, in questioning these politicians but they also lie about the vaccines as uh, Kirsty Walt proved when Jacob Rees-Mogg tried to pull that nonsense out of the bag on Newsnight on, on, on Monday night. Absolute hogwash that we had to leave the European Union to undertake our own vaccine programme. It is just a lie to claim that, and yet they repeatedly claim it. It's incredible. And then when asked for proof that Boris Johnson isn't a liar, he comes up with the vaccines. Listen to that again. This is the sound of a man's final shred of dignity disappearing down the toilet bowl of ambition. Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time, Mr Zahawi? Yes, I do, because I... And once more, with feeling, do you believe that the Prime Minister tells the truth all the time? How much evidence do you need? He's been lying all weekend. He, I mean, the Chancellor and the Health Secretary have just resigned because he doesn't tell the truth, because he lies. Investigations are underway into whether or not he knowingly misled Parliament. His official spokesman has had to publicly apologise for knowingly misleading journalists. In fact, Will Quince's resignation today is directly linked to the fact that he was sent out on Monday to tour the studios, telling things that he now knows were not true. Who do you think told him to say those things? But here's Nadeem Zahawi. Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time, Mr Zahawi? Yes, I do. Because Just think about that for a minute. That is what you need to be now to achieve advancement in Boris Johnson's administration. You're not just being economical with the truth. You're not just embellishing or exaggerating or evading. You are holding a piece of cheese in your hand and telling the British people that it's a diamond. You are lying in such a base and transparent way that even a toddler would balk at the... <sighs> can't use that word live on the radio. At the audacity of it. The sheer bouncing audacity of it. it another story, you know what stories bursting to emerge from my memory now, don't you? Six years old, Chattersley Corbett, pick your own strawberry farm. You can eat a few when you're going around the strawberry, James, but don't eat too many, all right? Back to the weigh in, I bring up my little punnet, and the farmer says, Have you been eating any strawberries? And I say, No, sir. No, sir, none at all. And everybody in the, in the, in the weighing room starts laughing. I don't, why, don't, why are they everyone laughing at me? Because I'm covered in strawberry juice. That's the themes of Harvey, except the stakes are rather higher. James is in Bognor Regis. James, why now? Why this lie? Uh, I think it comes down to saving their own skin, personally. Um, I think it's got to the point where, you know, their positions look to be untenable for the future. They're focusing on their future rather but than... So Harvey doesn't think so, does he? He thinks that this is, I don't know, a step up for him rather than a step down. And yet Sunak and Javid think that it's, it's the end. Do I sound really naive when I say to you, James, that I, I really hope there is something that could be described as principle behind the actions of Javid and Sunak? I think so. I think it comes <laughs> down to what, what, what they look like, essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, in the future, they're going to be looking to keep themselves, you know, in, in what power they can. And, you know, standing behind someone like Boris, sure, it works for the here and now because, you know, he's prime minister now. Mm. But I think they're looking to the future and saying, you know, this, you know, we're not going to be here for long. We need to, 
look as though we have some shred of evidence, uh, evidence, some shred of decency, um, and then you know. But then, what, can, so why, why now? They've later. reached. So what you've got then is a balancing act in your mind. You've got a balancing act where, on one side of the scales, you have the filth of this administration and and the association with it, and on the other side of the scales, you have ambition and status. Uh, and also, to give them credit, maybe they think it's better to be outside the, inside the tent weeing out than it is to be outside the tent weeing in, or maybe they think if they're on the boat and they, 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 they can exercise influence over the captain, then it's less likely to crash into icebergs. So you can be as generous a, 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 as you want on that front, but the point is there are scales inside every one of them, and on one side of the scale lies ambition and status, vanity, self-regard, and on the other side lies, if you like, the, 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 the reality of the situation in which they're in. And they've now decided that the, the, the prestige of being Chancellor of the Exchequer does not outweigh the shame of being part of this administration and being complicit in Boris Johnson's deceptions, which makes the whole position fascinating, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think part of it as well, it, what Rishi was saying, you know, you know, we heavily disagree in private and in public, you know, I'm, I'm happy to back you. And I think it could come down to that as well, as he's, as he's going, you know, I've got not only my private image, but, you know, my public image to, to maintain as well. And in order to, you know... I wonder how the they future. square it with their children. I mean, even even relatively young children now are... are, are, are I presume Boris Johnson is a, is a byword for a big fat liar in the playgrounds of the United Kingdom. And I wonder how you square it with your own children that you're still in hot with a, with a man who wouldn't know the truth if it sat on his head. I mean, some good news finally for Boris Johnson. Lee Anderson has withdrawn his support of the of Prime Minister, the ludicrous MP, who was claiming recently that you can feed families on, on 30p per meal or per day even, I forget which. He says, I have remembered... Remained loyal to the Prime Minister since being elected in 2019. That 29 intake, there's a book to be written, by the way. I'm not going to write it. I, I, I just haven't got the energy. But if I did, I could put you in touch with my publishers. That 29 intake, what would you call it? Who let the dogs out? I, I don't know. I mean, that 29 intake, utterly, almost entirely devoid of talent. Quite incredible. Um, but worse than being devoid of talent, they've got whatever the opposite of talent is in spades. And Lee Anderson being something of a poster boy for, for, for precisely that phenomenon. It has come to light that the PM was made aware of a complaint in the past in relation to Mr Pincher's inappropriate behaviour, but then went on to promote Mr Pincher to Deputy Chief Whip. You know, he's accused of uh, behaviour that Boris Johnson has also been accused of. <laughs> uh, Boris Johnson accused of, of um, groping women at, uh, at a spectator lunch when he was editor there. One woman sat to one side of him saying that she grabbed his thigh. She, he grabbed her thigh enough to make her wince. All of these behaviours, and, and his dad has been criticised for being handsy as well, hasn't he, in the past. So why this, why now? Why this lie? Why this behaviour? Why this scandal? Why has this pushed these people over the edge? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Sophie's in Mitcham. Sophie, what do you think? <laughs> Good morning. Well, Hello. I'm trying not to laugh and giggle, but Fair I enough. think the Tory government, the cabinet, are a bunch of self-serving narcissistic sycophants. Yeah. Javed, Funak, Zahawi, they're staying and leaving for the same reasons. Go on. To save the last vestiges of their political careers. Not honour. They're not doing it because they're good people. But can they, can they, can you do that? Can you do completely different things for the same yeah, you reason? Can. can you? Yeah, you can. Go and on. you know, I heard someone, I heard a, a, a politician, a, a Tory politician this morning say that it's, it's like, mm. for, for Zahari, it's like moving your deck chair on the sinking Titanic. Right. So, they're, 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 they're leaving, the, the ones who've left, Sunak and Javed, they think they might have a shot at leadership. Zahawi, any person who can say <laughs> that Boris Johnson has integrity, uh, it is just, he's a lost cause as well. They're all the same. Well, I, you know, I'm going, I'm going to disagree with you, although I, only 52-48. For, 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 for the record, in terms of my, the, the strength of my disagreement. But I think, that, I think that Sunak and Javid have had enough, actually, regardless of whether or not they've got their eye on a bigger prize further down the line. I actually do, and, and again, I don't know how big a proportion of their motivation is down to this, but I gen genuinely think that the idea of having to go out and defend this was just too much for them.
Maybe, maybe not. But the point is, they've defended every other thing. Yeah. And I'm saying, but that's their hearing, job. That's their job, though. I mean, everybody defends things that they may not be a hundred percent supportive of. If no, they, well, are, it's part of collective. One, one lie after another, and so well, they've done it so well. They've done it with so much vigor and passion. No, well, these two haven't. Cabinet, again, I'm going to I'm going to argue with you again, not just for the sake of it, but these two haven't yeah. been particularly passionate defenders of of Boris Johnson. They're not they're not Reese Moggs or or, or Dorries or Therese Coffees or or, or or Grant Shapses, are they? They haven't been touring okay, the studios, debasing even themselves. Even now, in 2022, we're still taking people to court, the human rights on human rights basis for those people who were simply jailers mm. in World War Two. Nazis. Right. That's a really feeble excuse to say, well, I'm, they're bad, but not as bad as, sorry, James. But I, I agree you with you on, on not 52 or 48, 99.9 okay. things, but I think that you're okay, being I, really think, I, I think the Overton window probably needs shutting. Uh, 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 no, the, the, the Godwin's law probably needs shutting at this point. I don't, I don't think that putting concentration camp guards on trial. Uh, uh, 80 years after the end of the Second World War is, is, is necessarily comparable, well, is remotely comparable to um, being in Boris Johnson's cabinet. 10.37 is the time. The Zahawi question fascinates me. Um, we might move on to that in the second hour. Mark's in Glasgow. Why now, Mark? So far, it's fair to say that Rishi Sunak, and I don't know whether they'd care or not, and Sajid Javid and the rest of them are not emerging with their reputations enhanced. And there is a genuine part of me that wonders whether that's a little unfair. Well, the thing is, from my perspective, I agree with, uh, with a, a good portion of what mm. the previous call was saying, to an extent, apart of that last bit. Got a bit <laughs> it did go, it did go uh, a little bit off the edge, didn't it, at the end? But, uh, yeah, of course. The, the thing is, for me, I do believe this is complete self-serving, um, start to finish. It's self-serving now, then, and forever. And I remember when I was listening to it in the car yesterday when my girlfriend and I were going to the supermarket, and I got so... F infuriatedly angry mm. and vocal about this with her in the car to the point where she was like, can we just go shopping please? Um, because that it, it's disengaged me from politics so much that it, I don't care what any of them say anymore. Yeah. Like, see right now, I don't believe for a second that they're actually thinking, oh, this has went one step too far. How many steps down the road do you need to go before you look back and think, you know, well, I, did, did, I don't know if you were listening yesterday or whether you were too disengaged from politics, but the Simon MacDonald letter was a game changer. It took me a while to recognise just how significant it was, but the best way we came up with of describing it was that, and this reminds me of Trump actually, when the bad behaviour is extraordinary, completely out of the ordinary, unlike anything we've ever seen before, then the good behaviour has to be as well. So for a member of the House of Lords, a former permanent secretary in the Foreign Office, to go public with an accusation of lying against Downing Street is unheard of, it's unprecedented. But because like you, I'm so swamped by it all now, and so fatigued by it, exhausted really by the quantity, never mind the quality of the corruption, I kind of missed how significant that was for 10 minutes yesterday morning. And I think that is different, and that lends a little bit of credibility or credence to the idea that Sunak and Javid have actually acted out of out of principle. See, I can't agree with that. No, because no. from my perspective, it feels like all they've ever done is try to get to another day. And that's still what this government's doing. They're not governing anything. They're not interested. But Javid, as as Javid, God almighty, mate, you've turned me into the Sajid Javid defence society. <laughs> but Javid resigned as Chancellor, didn't he? Because he wouldn't dance to Dominic Cummings' tune. So... I, I, I mean, look, yeah, it's, I it's, a, it's not... More, go on. That, that feels it more down to the fact that he doesn't believe Dominic Cummings should be able to tell him what's going on. But that's a principle, than, isn't it? Yeah, it's a principle of ego, not a principle of I'm doing the right thing for the country. Because <laughs> at what point did they ever show any other evidence of him doing that? You're a hard task master, man, aren't you? You really are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, like, you know... Up in Scotland, the, the whole debate at the moment is independence, obviously. Yeah. And it's things like this that make me go, why do I want to be part of this any longer? How, how can I be... I'm so jaded with the way things are run from a, a UK... And, 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 and this, is, this is the biggest part of what we mentioned earlier, is the, 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 the legacy of this mess going way beyond Boris Johnson's tenure as Prime Minister. And it could still, of course, consume the, the union itself. And, and, and I don't think this will change anything either, because... 
all they're trying to do right now is protect their careers. They've had a career on paper and CV that will set them up for life. No politician has done anything that bad other than illegal things, outright illegal things, horrible, you know, things that we'd all get in trouble for. That has actually harmed their career. Even Nigel Farage still has a career. So yeah. do I honestly sit here and believe that these guys are stepping back and oh, no, their they, careers I mean, are over? No, they, they, no one's saying that. I, I mean, they, 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 Sunak has suggested he may never hold a senior ministerial office again, and, and that may well be true, but he's still one of the richest people in the country, and, and Javid, like, like Nadeem Zahawi, is very wealthy as well. They've, they've all got questions to answer about some of the sort of uh, financial arrangements, but the, 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 the idea of personal security isn't under threat for any of them, which may be part of what allows them to, to make these stands. But I, all right, so you've all boxed me now into a very unfamiliar and uncomfortable position, and I think it's desperation on my part. Desperation to believe that, <laughs> that there are glimmers of decency in our government and that they have been drowned out by Boris Johnson's corruption, but that people have found it very difficult to go along with this. And, and I'd point, and believe me, I don't want to, but I'd point at Nadine Dorries as a way of proving that there must be some decency in that cabinet, otherwise they'd all be behaving like her. They'd all be behaving in utterly ridiculous and ever more ludicrous ways. And they're not. Which means that, well, I don't know. I... <laughs> There has to be, doesn't there? Some some semblance of, of, of decency underpinning these decisions to resign, to say that, that I've had enough? Or has it been so awful for so long, as Mark and most of my callers today seem to believe, it's been so awful for so long that calling it out now is almost worse than never calling it out at all. 0345 606 As you heard, Robert Halfen... Very much a loyalist, Conservative MP for Harlow in Essex, chair of the Education Select Committee, has now called upon the Prime Minister to step down. Two of the particularly stupid um, 2019 intake, uh, Lee Anderson and Jonathan Gullis, have also called upon the Prime Minister to step down. Gullis in particular, one of the people that can be seen behaving like a sort of scrapyard dog at PMQs, shouting and bellowing his support for the Prime Minister without... Um, being able to articulate necessarily many words. I'm hearing that Chris um, Skidmore has submitted a letter of no confidence in the Prime Minister as well. Skidmore, of course, the least known co-author of that disgusting tract, Britannia Unchained, which suggested that you were the laziest workers in the world, written by Pretty Patel, Liz Trust, Quasi Quateng, Dominic Raab and Chris Skidmore. So one down, four to go on that front. That, that, that book famously accusing British workers of being among the idlest on the planet. Um, it's coming up to 10.45. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Phones are going nuts. I'm not asking specific questions necessarily beyond the broad inquiry as to why now. And I am sounding a bit pathetic, aren't I? And, and I make no apology for that today. I'm not ready to accept, as Anirin Bevin famously observed, that Tories are all lower than vermin. I, I think there's an awful lot of evidence to support that position, but I can't accept it. I don't want to accept it, and therefore, as things stand today, I won't accept it. There has to, I know there has been some decency on those benches over the course of my lifetime, and I have to believe that there is still some decency there now, but whether or not that decency extends to a defence of the ongoing resignations, I, I don't know. You're making me question it. Oh, James, just enjoy it. Honestly, this Devil's Advocate Act isn't fooling any of us. This should be a party show with a countdown to PMQ, says Dan in Newcastle. And I'm going to have a proper think about that, Dan, as we, as, we, as we take a few moments, because you might be right. Maybe I am being, for once in my life, whisper it very quietly, a bit too professional. Yeah, that's incredible. I literally signed off two minutes ago, suggesting that I was indulging in too much professionalism, and then I was actually watching something on the screen when we came back and didn't notice that we were live again. So I've gone from claiming, fairly ridiculously, that I was being a bit too professional in attempting to see some decency in the conduct of Sajid Javid and, and Rishi Sunak to being so completely unprofessional that I was distracted by events on the screen in front of me. And uh, I, I can't even pretend it was politics. Uh, I'll tell you what it was if you're very, very good shortly before PMQs today. Or if you follow me on Twitter, you'll be able to tell what I was looking at because I just retweeted it. It's 10.49. I think this is this is a new low. This is I, I'm going to hit this, I'm afraid, like... Uh, I don't know, like, like, like Glenn Miller hit Little Brown Jug. This is going down as one of the greatest hits. This is the sound of Nadine Zahawi, who was well regarded on, um, 
arrival in the education department, I, I was told by people who know that he was, I, I mean, a huge breath of fresh air after Gavin Williamson, obviously, but to be honest with you, a, a caravan full of swamp gas would count as a huge breath air, a, a huge uh, breath of fresh air after Gavin Williamson, but he was so desperate to be Chancellor that he reportedly used it as leverage, threatened to resign. This was reported last night, although Zahawi has denied it, but given what you're about to hear him say, I'm afraid you can't trust the syllable that comes out of Nadeem Zahawi's mouth either. So if he hadn't been made Chancellor, he would have joined Sunak and Sajid Javid on the subs bench. He would have, he would have walked the plank as well. But this is astonishing. Given everything that's happened over the last few days, and given the exodus of government members and previously supportive MPs, for, for him to have to do this on day one in the job, to have to do this, because I don't know if he could have answered the question any other way, which is why it was such a brilliant question yet again from Susanna Reid on Good Morning Britain. How else could he have answered this question if not in the way that he did? And the fact that he has to answer this question in the way that he did is evidence that the game is up. Even as the ink upon his appointment to the Chancellor of the Exchequer ship is, is, is still to dry. This is incredible. This is literally lying to you about the evidence of your own eyes and ears. Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time, Mr Zahawi? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Not, not even his wife thinks that he's honest all the time, or any of his wives, or his mystery. I mean, nobody thinks he's honest all the time. I'm just pretty sure Rachel Johnson, his sister, wouldn't claim that he's honest all the time. You can ask her when she's on LBC at the weekend. His brother, Joe Johnson, resigned from the Parliamentary Conservative Party after he became leader. Do you think he would claim that Boris Johnson is honest all the time? It's incredible What's that, what, what uh, Nadim Zahawi has been reduced to. Absolutely incredible. Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time? Mr. Zahawi? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Good grief. Nick's in Bristol. Nick, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello, Nick. Yeah, so, w where do you want to go first? The straw question or the Zahawi question? The, why now? Why, why is it why happening now? now? It's, yes. it's not dishonesty. They priced that in year long ago. Right. It's, it's the stupidity. It's the transparent lack of, it, of, of any basic idea of how to run what's supposed to be this D Downing Street machine that is now exposed to something somewhere between Heath Robinson and the Sinclair C5. Nicely put. But the problem with this, right, is, I don't, I don't want to be glib, and, uh, but, but, but y you know, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So there has to, everyone's allowed a breaking point. Nick. And, and many of us have been aware of how rancid this regime is since it started, because we understood that it was built upon the nonsense of Brexit. But a lot of people don't understand that, and they don't believe it, and they still don't understand that, and they still don't believe it. So supporting, especially in Sunak's case, supporting Boris Johnson and or Brexit hasn't involved necessarily three years of, of biting your tongue and sitting on your hands. I think they believe in the project. The, the obvious parallel, perhaps, is with Corbynism. They're absolutely crackers, but they actually believe in, in the project. So I think you have to allow them a breaking point. You have to allow them a penny drop moment or a scales falling from well, the eyes. I think that was what we got on Friday when, right. when, when, when this ridiculous line came out that the Prime Minister was not aware of mm. any specific allegations. And when that, when that dropped, mm. I'd, I'd, I just gaped. I said, what? Yeah. Really? You, you cannot be serious. The, 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 this guy had resigned as a minister, for goodness sake. How is it even conceivable that, they, that they couldn't have been aware of any specific allegations at that stage? That obviously was not going to hold water for more than 48 hours, and indeed it didn't. But why Just has it like, worked in the past? This has worked in the past for him, the, the, the blatant yeah, but, denials, but, but, the, the abject but, untruth. But I think you've, you've got a kind of diminishing returns thing. Uh, uh, Initially, they couldn't think more than three moves ahead. Now they, they, now they can't even think more than one move ahead. And, and, um, yeah. and I, I yeah. think it's, 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 it's like that, a... That it's just got to, got to the shrewder... Um, an engulfment. It's, it's an engulfment. They've been engulfed by it now. They've always managed to keep one stage ahead of this sort of tsunami of sewage that Boris Johnson pause and spreads everywhere he goes but now now it's caught them it's just lapping at their heels and they can't get out of it now exactly and 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 all they were going to face was a a, a tsunami of of events dear boy events, yeah, events because dear boy. because there was no 
um, there was no calculation in place, no mechanism in place to deal with any of that. Um, they were just going to be completely at the, uh, at the it's all we've uh, got at, at, the, at the mercy of this stuff, and the, and they they just had enough of it. And, all we've um, got is the lie, and it's worked in the past, and they will go with it again. But there will come a point where it no longer works; it no longer washes. So, yeah. no sympathy at all, no argument that um, that Sunak and Javid have behaved with a scintilla of, of of integrity, a scintilla of decency. Yes, I, I, I they they got out. I think. Um, at the, at the, at, on their calculations, at mm. the earliest moment they could, there, there, there's always this conundrum of he, she, who wields the dagger, etc. Yes, and they've both, they've got um, so so that was holding them back, and um, so so it's interesting that Truss and Wallace have, have still nailed their colours to the rotten Johnson mask, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, I suppose that's what. The I think we've heard quite there, enough. Although with Wallace, there's maybe something else going on there. That we've actually... heard quite enough about the Johnson mast in recent days. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd thank you. I'd thank you for for, for, for for not bringing that back to our attention. And as much as I'd like to hear your thoughts on Zahawi, I'm going to move on because there's so many people waiting to speak. Donna, for example, is in Amsterdam. Donna, what's going on? Hello, James. Hello, Donna. Hi, hi. James, you owe me a speeding ticket. I had to rush home. I was so... Once I knew the programme was on, I had to rush home. <laughs> what a compliment. I'm so, James, I'm fuming. Fantastic. Oh, my God. So I'm we fuming. are actually talking about parking tickets or speeding tickets on the programme, <laughs> despite... <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> Carry on. OK, so the thing is that when I walked at home, walked in at home, we were talking about has there been anything honourable from Rishi or, or Savage Abid. Well, with regards to um, Rishi, don't make me laugh, please. I think especially when we were talk when the situation with the non dom situation came out, yeah. when he was squeezing the, the public um, in this time of really, really bad fiscal situation and the, the small loophole, the private loophole which had to pay to be a member of the non dom. He was jumping through it. He well, his wife was. He, he, I, I, it's a, I think it's an important detail that it was his wife's financial arrangements that you're referring to, not his own. But, I agree. But, I agree. But, know, like, but it's still not a great. It's not was. a great look any more than Nadim Zahawi claiming for heating his stables on expenses is is, is a great look. Although I guess that uh, standards are shifting every hour at the moment, aren't they? But you know, James, that for me, for me, that would have been the time to resign. Right. That then would have been the honourable time to, to resign. But as for now, no, uh, not at all. And now, today, we have Boris blaming Rishi, saying now we can have a new tax cut. Yeah, that's right. He According to Rishi reports blaming, of last night's, right. last night's meeting with, with Tory MPs, I know you lot love tax cuts, and now this might actually be a good <sighs> thing because now we can have them, which is incredibly delinquent yeah. behaviour. We've got Richard blaming Boris in yeah. a resignation letter saying, I disagree with you privately, but I, I, you know, in public eye. Oh, James, honestly, it's so embarrassing as an expat. People ask us what's going on over there. Have you tried pretending it's to be so Dutch? so embarrassing. Just pretend you're not yeah, English. Not <laughs> do, do speak like Steve McLaren did. When I get upset, as you can hear now, my accent it, comes out. This is and pure I Manchester. Can't you, can't, you can't hide <laughs> it. it. You just outed yourself as a pure <laughs> Manchester. That's terrible. So but for you, know, you, it's the time. Much, it, yeah. There's too much sewage under the bridge for them now to claim that it's the stench of the sewage that is making them walk away. I think sewage is the right word. The stench is so prevailing. And I thought that I couldn't stand watching Boris on TV. I couldn't what, take it anymore. Then I saw Nadine Zahawi in all his glory and I was reminded if he takes over, then I really just don't know what I'm going to do. He's even more repulsive. I'm sorry. Well, that, I mean, that's the, that, that we are actually then in agreement because the closest I can come to a zinger in my very called a muted defence of what's his chops, Javid and, and, and Sunak, is, look, they're not as bad as you're saying they are, because look at Nadim Zahawi, and, and we could agree at least on that, that he is measurably worse than they are. No, I think I wish he was uh, worse. Really? I'm sorry. I think, right. Yeah, I do. I think he, uh, um, the Harvey I find I find unpleasant to watch and I find him belligerent, but Rishi, if he was going to even pretend to be honourable yeah, and do the right enough. thing, he missed, he missed a golden opportunity to do that. No. And, and I'm celebrating a lot of them, James. I'm, for, I'm I, I, I can tell you are, and I think I am as well. I think Dan in Newcastle was right, and I have kind of adopted this devil's advocate position out of misplaced professionalism. I, I'll try and shed it during the 11 o'clock news. But your attitude to politics in general, how much of this stench infiltrates 
the other side of the House of Commons. I mean, the desperate attempts, and they're going to be ramped up now, like you wouldn't believe, to, to claim they're all as bad as each other, and um, something, something, Diane Abbott, something, something, is, is a counter to this cavalcade of corruption in the Conservative Party. Does, does, that, does that wash from where you are looking from the outside, back at, back at home? I think um, that Labour, I would have hoped that Labour would have gained more traction on this. But honestly, if they miss this open gate, they have themselves to blame. They have themselves Can't to blame. Can't argue with that. And I mean, I don't know how you fight the, 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 the psyops of the Daily Mail and, and other um, rancid right-wing organs. I don't know how you fight those psyops. You saw how effective they are after the two weeks of front pages suddenly resurrected the non-story of Keir Starmer's curry into the biggest... Um, issue in town, even Durham police falling into line behind the Daily Mail's editorial line, although I think we're pretty close to being able to conclude that the newish editor of the Daily Mail's decision to bet the house, the whole house, and nothing but the house, on Boris Johnson's premiership was one of the worst decisions ever taken by a newspaper editor in the history of newspapers. PMQ's on the way at 12. My goodness me, it's an exciting day. The only fly in the ointment is that Theo Oshwood is not here this week, but Rachel Venables will join me to have a little look at what is likely to transpire. A masterclass in professionalism and devil's advocacy so far this morning. Should we move it on slightly now? Not just Nadim Zahawi, but the rest of them who have pledged their troth or nailed their colours, as, as, as Nick just um, rather colourfully reminded us, to Boris Johnson's mast. Because he's a liar. He is a law-breaking liar. He is a serial liar. He is a pathological liar. He lies about anything and everything. He lies to wives. He lies to mistresses. He lies about children. He lies to bosses. He lies to party leaders. He lies to backbenchers. He lies to constituents. He lies to voters. He lies probably to himself. He is a liar like you very rarely see. A liar so committed to lying that he doesn't know what the truth is. This is almost an excuse for some of his behaviour. It's not, I mean, because his behaviour is obviously inexcusable. But somebody who knows that they're lying when they lie, and somebody who is so curdled that they actually don't know they're lying when they lie. They are two slightly different propositions. You know the gulp that people sometimes do? I don't know whether you lie a lot or whether you've lied recently, but you do a gulp. You, you, you can hear it sometimes. A police interviewers will tell you that there are tells, there are, well, poker players will tell you as well, there are giveaways that betray the fact that we are telling a lie, or bluffing in the case of cards, the, the, the way your eyes go. Look, it's not foolproof. You can train yourself to do it, I, 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 according to some of the crime fiction I've read. But your eyes can give away whether you're telling the truth or not. You look a certain way when you're lying. You, you, you look up to the left. I, don't, I can't remember which one it is, but for example... The gulp is quite a big one. You sometimes catch people gulping. It can just be nerves. I remember when I used to do readings in church sometimes, I, I used to do a gulp when I was a kid, because so, I'd look up and there was a church full of people, and you get really nervous, I'd do a gulp, but sometimes you do it when you lie. He lies in a way that suggests he doesn't know he's lying. He, I think he believes a lot of the stuff he comes out with. I really do. I think he believes the stuff about vaccines because he hasn't allowed himself to stop to think about it properly. But I don't believe that all the people who parrot the nonsense about vaccines believe it. You know that Jacob Rees-Mogg doesn't believe it because he isn't bright enough to keep the lie afloat when someone, thank goodness, finally gets around to asking him why he keeps claiming that we had to leave the European Union in order to have our own vaccine programme, which is a lie. It's simply a lie. And I think he knows it's a lie, but I don't know that Boris Johnson knows it's a lie. I think there's a psychological state or condition where the end justifies the means to such a degree that you don't actually afford any moral weight to the means. The ends is so all-consuming, the end is so dominating that the means don't matter. The end is so important that it doesn't just, it doesn't just justify the means, which is the old phrase, the end justifies the means, but it, it actually almost silences the conscience. It does silence. Well, he hasn't got a conscience. That's not a very good image. It, it negates the notion 
of the means having moral value. All that the means exist to do is to achieve the ends. So he, I don't think he knows he's lying. So, I, I mean, the phone lines are full up at the moment, but we'll try and free up a couple, or I could just speak to some callers, couldn't I? That's probably the best way of freeing up a couple of phone lines. The ones that stay loyal to him, and let's ignore the ridiculous ones, like like your, your, your Dorries and your Rhys Mogg, who have no choice, because, um, I mean, under any other Prime Minister, they'd be... Uh, in all sorts of bother. We've got another resignation, this time as a parliamentary private secretary in the Department of Business. That's Felicity Buck, an MP. That brings the total resigning from government, I think, up to 14, does it? I think it's hard to keep track. But the one staying loyal. So Zahawi's interesting, but at least you can explain that on the grounds of vanity and ambition. Nadeem Zahawi believes that that swell of pride he feels when he reflects upon being Chancellor of the Exchequer. I, Nadim Zahawi, am Chancellor of the Exchequer. Like a sort of Steve Coogan character who'll be looking himself in the mirror today and, and, and sort of going, grrr, yeah, G go me, go Nads. Nadim Zahawi, Chancellor of the Exchequer, that's got a certain ring to it. And he'll be looking at himself in the mirror and possibly trying to raise one eyebrow like Roger Moore. And he'll be hoping that that swell of pride, that rush of vanity that he feels and that sense of achievement such as it is will be strong enough and loud enough to drown out the voice of his conscience saying it doesn't count because you've taken it from a corrupt prime minister and you've corrupted yourself in accepting the job way more than you had already the defense of it being better to be in the room where it happens the defense of being able to exert influence over the man with his hand on the tiller however appalling he may be all of those defenses have gone for nadim zahawi now he he has he's gone all in on supporting boris johnson which meant that within hours of getting the job he's on national television describing a proven serial liar as someone who always tells the truth an incredible collapse an incredible decline the speed of which i can't remember ever witnessing before in british politics i'm not suggesting he was squeaky clean prior to yesterday evening but to surrender every last vestige of dignity integrity and honesty upon the altar of boris johnson's busted flush of a premiership it's breathtaking in its stupidity and its arrogance and the only way you can explain it is by setting that little swell of pride that he's feeling against that still small voice of calm insisting when he's not hearing Alistair Campbell's voice in his head, hearing his own voice saying, you've carked it, Nadim. What have you done? What have you done? And the answer is, you've done it. You've sold it. Your soul. Yourself. It's 11.11. So the people that are staying loyal, what's that about? Not, not the ones that need to, because they wouldn't get arrested under any other prime minister, but the ones that choose to, the Shapses, perhaps, the Trusses, the Wallaces, 03456060973. Uh, Craig's in Cannock. Craig, what would you like to say? Hi, James, how are you doing? Well, pretty good, since you asked. What's on your mind? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I was initially phoning about the what's, uh, what's caused them to jump now, but yes. uh, in terms of the latest question, I can probably answer that as well. Yeah, well, to pick um, one, pick one, because there's a lot of people well, waiting today. Okay, well, I'll, I'll give you a very short answer to the what's caused them to jump. Yeah. Tiverton and Wakefield. Yeah, probably. This is the, this is the first, shall we say, significant thing that's happened uh, the, the the whole thing with Pincher mm. since those two by-election losses, and they've found out quite how badly that the Conservatives are being looked at mm. by the nation, uh, where they perhaps previously were deluded that oh we're still in with a chance for the coming uh, coming election in a couple of years' time. That, so that's and, what's uh, focused. I mean, I can't believe it's taken us an hour and ten minutes to get to that point, and, and equally, I can't believe I missed it. But you're, of course, you're right. That was the game changer. Yeah. The pre-pincher game changer was the electoral collapse, wasn't it, in in Devon? Yeah. And, and what's happened is with Pincher, they've uh, it's given uh, for the the thirteen. Is it still thirteen, or has it gone up now? Fourteen now, uh, mate. <laughs> although I don't have only I've only checked in the last four minutes. Is it fourteen still? Yeah. We're looking at fourteen. Fourteen. Carry on. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's given them a reason that they can actually leave and suggest that they still have... John Glenn, 15, 15, it's 15. John Glenn, Treasury Minister, has gone 15. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah. Do you remember when, when you were a kid, James, because you're a similar age to me, that yeah. there was a, a, a toy that came out called Domino Rally? Yes. <laughs> this is what's happening now. 
It was just where you, know, you just what mean the dominoes just toppling the game. Going. Yeah, you just set yeah. it up and push one, and they all fall over. Well, they're not all gone. That, that's I mean, the one. Yeah, but it's just a matter of time the way it's going. I think. Mm. Um, you know, they did not all go the second you push the first one down. It built built up some momentum, and they just went one after the other. But. So he's, what, he's talk to me then briefly, team. briefly about the ones who are not dominoes or aren't falling. So your, your, your Trusses, your Shapses, your Wallaces, yeah. and to a lesser extent your Zahawis, what, what are they thinking at the moment? Everyone has their 30 pieces of silver. Yeah. Their price that they have. Now we've well, That's why I've been speaking warmly Sunak. about Javid and Sunak actually today. Yeah. A, a little I mean, more warmly than some, let's say. Yeah, but they've, they've got a situation where... Rightly or wrongly, they were a bit more in the public eye, a bit more of a, if you yes. like, like, a household name, and so potentially have more chance of power later on. The ones that are, say, less liked by the public, mm -hmm. in general, the ones that are less well-known, so Zahawi, Truss, uh, Priti Patel, uh, I, I think it's fair to say he's less well liked by a lot of people. Mm. Uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, mm. they are much less likely to have any chance of this power again than such as Sunak and Javid. Who, yeah, although Ben Wallace is, is currently the most popular among Conservative members, I mean, Liz Truss has been riding pretty high in those polls for quite a long time because they still don't realise that all her talk about trade deals is cobblers, but, you know, make hay while the sun shines. I, I don't know that it fully explains the, 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 the behaviour of, of, of a couple of them. But it's, I mean, it's better than no explanation at all, isn't it? Yeah. I think it's also a case of, you know, the position's getting shall we say, more and more precarious to say a government minister, and it's about how how well you can hold on without the mud sticking to you. Well, it's quarter past 11. How well you perceive that. Yeah, I mean, it is absolutely fascinating at quarter past 11 on a, on a Wednesday morning to see 15 members of government now having submitted their resignations that, uh, as part of an exodus that started at 6 o'clock on Tuesday evening. I mean, that is incredible, especially given that most of us were asleep for at least eight of those hours. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely breathtaking. Craig, thank you. I'll just run through the names because I have no reason, really. They've just been given to me. Rishi Sunak, Sajid Javid, um, Bim Afalami, Jonathan Gullis, Nicola Richards, Saki Bati, Virginia Crosby, Alex Chalk, the Solicitor General, Andrew Murison, the Trade Envoy to Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, folks. <but it's laughs> <laughs> this is who, 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 what did he make Kavchinsky? You know that absolute. I can't say that on the radio. That ridiculous MP down in Shrewsbury. Was he not made trade envoy to Outer Mongolia, or was that a joke in Viz? Magazine. I don't know. I don't know why that tickled me there. Trade envoy to Morocco. Attributes. That's probably one of the trade deals that Liz Truss is going to claim is going to replace membership of the single market soon. Um, Theo Clark, trade envoy to Kenya. Laura Trot, PPS at Transport. Will Quince. Will Quince and Robin Walker resigned within minutes of each other, which is sort of flashback to Midsummer Night's Dream for anyone who studied that at school. Uh, Felicity Buchan and most recently John Glenn, about five minutes ago. He is an economic secretary, the economic secretary at the Treasury and a city minister. So again, one of the more senior uh, res resigners, certainly more senior than the trade envoy to Morocco. Um, I've got some phone lines free for the first time since 10 o'clock this morning. So the loyal loyalists, well, what are they up to? So I'm going to rule out, Craig's covered the ground, you don't need to cover it again. The argument that they are so useless, this is their last chance of office, so they're going to cling on to it for as long as they can. One of them's going to have to go, you know. I think as this... As this avalanche grows as this exodus grows one, one of the people who who have seemed loyal thus far may may t i don't know I, i've never known anything like this i can't believe it i can't believe we have to take adverts and news bulletins i'd like to just sit here i can't believe i've got to hand over to sheila at one o'clock and eddie i want to stay on air until he's gone because i think it's going to happen today i really do or certainly before i go on holiday I break up at one o'clock on Friday, and normally these events unfold while I am sunning myself on a on a beach. And of course, I'm not secretary of staff, not foreign secretary, so I'm allowed to sun myself on a beach while massively important things happen in places like Kabul, for example. Uh, Dominic Raab, where they? We haven't heard much from him, have we? So Raab gets filed under Rees Mogg and Dorries, doesn't he? There's someone who wouldn't get arrested under any other prime minister. Although Theresa May made him. Minister for Brexit, didn't he? Didn't she? That's when he found out how important the Dover-Calais crossing was for British trade. 
And we should probably hear the apology because I think the question of why now, why this straw and this particular camel's back is, is probably a combination of all the things that you have suggested today. So, of course, the, the Honiton and Tiverton result, m even more than the Wakefield result, but two big losses for the Tories in by-elections. That focuses the mind of MPs who are worried about losing their own seats. I was chatting to a Conservative MP yesterday, you wouldn't believe, would you? Um, all off the record, but I can tell you this bit, I checked. A, a lot of the 2019 lot, this is why I think Gullis and... Uh, and 30p Lee are so interesting. The, the, the They're fairly pessimistic about keeping their seat. They weren't really expecting to win these seats in the first place. So in terms of their post-parliamentary careers, loyalty has a different value than it would have in normal circumstances. They're only going to have been MPs for four or five years. And if they want to capitalise upon that in the future, either in the political sphere or in the commercial sphere, then having only been there for 10 minutes and stabbed the Conservative Prime Minister in the front during that period, some of them, I was told yesterday, calculate that that wouldn't be a great look. So even though they would like to join the chorus of disapproval, they're not going to because of their post-parliamentary careers rather than their parliamentary careers, which is one of the reasons why a lot of people perhaps also stay loyal. But we've got to be approaching the tipping point, haven't we? I'd be surprised if there hasn't been at least one more, possibly two more resignations by the time PMQs kicks in at 12 noon. And then you've got the prospect, although for the record I think it's very slim, but real, prospect of people crossing the floor, MPs crossing the floor in, in, in the House of Commons this afternoon. Holy moly. Uh, Paul's in Stratford. Paul, what would you like to say? Uh, good morning, James. Um, Hello, Paul. You've been, <clears throat> excuse me, you've been very generous as a, um, as a cognitive empath, giving the benefit of the doubt to Sunak and Javid. Thank you. Um, I you're, respectfully disagree. You're, less you're we'll feeling be... less generous today. Yes, I'm feeling less generous. <laughs> I think most you people are. are, actually, Paul. I'm um, not going to lie. Yeah, uh, they don't. They genuinely don't care about the lying. They don't care about the parties. They're no, not over worried. They. They're not over worried about the by elections. Uh, they're not even particularly worried about the knowing promotion of a sexual predator into a position of care for vulnerable MPs. Yeah. Their calculation on all of that comes down to a minuscule gap. They reckon that there's just enough space between them and Johnson, even though they're in the same cabinet, mm. for them, when it all goes tits up, for them to say, it wasn't me, Gov. The straw that I'm just going to like, apologise if anyone found that, that turn of phrase un, 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 unacceptable. I, I, I didn't press the button because I don't think it is um, verboten. Oh, I'm sorry, just, sorry, just, just, that's all right. It might be children that, listening. Um, it's OK. Um, what... The straw that broke the camel's back for them a couple of days ago was when the Daily Mail turned on Johnson. Ah, but then on Monday it turned back again. It turned back because there was, I mean, David Yellen picked up on this, didn't he? And a couple of other old Fleet Street hands suggested that, that Rothermere and Dacre were rowing about whether or not to stay loyal. Paul Dacre, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail and the man responsible for the most disgusting front pages in the history of the British media Great. um he's desperate to get his peerage so he wants to keep johnson in post until he's got his seat in the house of lords whereas rothermere has different and it was suggested that rothermere had prevailed and that they were turning on johnson i don't think it happened at the weekend because on monday they ran an editorial saying he's still the best man for the job even if he's bloody awful today however today i think they have i think they have fallen today yeah it's a calculation on the part of sunak and javid because right. they know that for, for their ambition to reach what they consider it should, um, they know that they need the likes of the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, and the you know all, all mm. the rest of the rabid right wing press that we've got. Um, that was their calculation. That was the straw that broke the back. It was the the concern that their personal ambition might be thwarted. It wasn't any more. Well, then let me nudge you. Else. Let me nudge you gently then towards. Ben Wallace and Liz Truss. What, are they just making different calculations? What's their motivation for doing the opposite of Sunak and Javid? Uh, Truss, I'm not entirely convinced she knows what she's doing. Fair um, enough. Ben Johnson is Wallace. the one person that I think that might actually come out of this cabinet with any credibility left. Right. Um, and for him, um, the Ukrainian situation could be a job saver because he will be able to hold his hand up. And how say, how can I? I wasn't how, involved with yeah, any of that because yeah. I was too busy with Ukraine. And also, how can I resign as Secretary yeah. of State for Defence while there is a war on? <laughs> yeah. He's the only one that may legitimately have an excuse there. That's uh, a good the, point. The rest of them, no. 
That's a good point. Yeah, I mean, imagine who he might be replaced with. When you look at the dwindling band of candidates, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Nadine Dorries would become Secretary of State for Defence, at which point she'd start getting guns mixed up with um, water pistols, quite probably. 24 minutes after 11, another brilliant contributor. Thank you, Paul. Ryan's in Halifax. Ryan, what would you like to say? Yeah, I, I think um, I think if we just look past Johnson for a second and consider no, the next le the next leader of the Conservative Party, if you've got a group of people around you <laughs> who are willing to defend Boris Johnson, they will defend anything. So if you were somebody, if you're the next person coming in and you look around and you say, "Oh, well, I've got Zahawi here," who for years and years was the person who was sent out to literally defend everything. If he's prepared to defend Johnson, then he's going to defend me, come along with me. So I actually think that the people who are sticking by him, particularly these ones who've been promoted, yeah. are not necessarily thinking about Johnson. They know that he's going to be gone in the next days and weeks. They're probably thinking about the next person that comes in and showing themselves to be compliant. So if you're loyal to Johnson, my goodness me, you're going to be loyal to me because I'm not going to be anywhere near as awful as Johnson is. So it becomes exactly. an almost like a point on a CV. We might be exactly. overthinking it, but I, can't, I mean, I quite like that. And I mean, also we're crediting them with a modicum of intelligence, which in at least two cases is probably over generous, isn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, someone like Dory, obviously, I mean, mm. the less said about her, the better. But I do Couldn't think that agree. someone like, I, I, I do think that someone like Zahawi, or who, Shaps, yeah, and the the kind of I'm gonna I nearly said they come across well, but stopped myself. I suppose they can string words together and complete sentences relatively well, you know. Mm. And I, I guess that's all you all I. Well, expect do you know from, it is? It, 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 I mean, astonishingly, but partly because of the woman you mentioned a moment ago, it is not a given that members of the cabinet can string a sentence together or indeed speak for more than two minutes without humiliating themselves on a previously unimaginable scale, whether it's getting rugby union and rugby league mixed up, not knowing how Channel 4 is funded or, 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 or talking utter twaddle about one of Britain's best-loved broadcasters. It's incredible how this stuff has unfolded yeah. in plain sight. Yeah, it's, it's a bleak carry-on, isn't it? And I think the other thing, that just to say really quickly, because I know you've got lots of callers waiting, mm. I noticed, I know you've already mentioned the thing about um, Zahawi and his stables, but I read about his, uh, mil, you know, multi-million pound oil contracts that he's got yes. and um, the links between um, the new education secretary and the PPE contracts. And it's just... You this think is Michelle you're... Donnellan and, and, and some family connections to companies that got big, big contracts. Michael Crick, uh, one of the great reporters of our times, has... has still got questions about some of Nadeem Zahawi's past business dealings that he considers to remain unanswered. Ryan very much on the ball with that stuff. But I quite like that idea of it being a sort of uh, a, a demonstration of loyalty. The door of 10 Downing Street is swinging open and shut at the moment, but w w what that means I do not know. I can tell you that Tom Hunt, another one of the ridiculous 2019 intake, a, a particularly pungent politician who... I think has a constituency in Ipswich. He has now submitted a letter of no confidence. If, if should we do a couple of minutes before the news on, on the 22 and what happens now? So the problem you've got essentially for the quiet MPs, the pearl clutchers, as Chris Bryant calls them in this week's full disclosure interview, the ones who will privately tell you how awful it is, but have not until now publicly done anything about it. They will feel that changing the rules of the 1922 committee to allow another vote of confidence in Boris Johnson would be the sort of tactic, the sort of sly tactic that Boris Johnson himself would deploy. So there's a modicum of reluctance about doing it. Nevertheless, I think that the elections that are currently underway and some of the people throwing their hats into the ring suggest that that is the direction of traffic. So there will be another vote of confidence before the summer recess as things stand. But that could be avoided if the chair of the 1922 committee uh, so Graham Brady, isn't it? If he receives, I would suggest, he it's not beyond the realms of possibility that he would receive more letters of no confidence from from Conservative MPs than he need. He, he would actually get more than half of the Parliamentary Conservative Party submitting letters of no confidence. Because you have to presume that every re resignation that we've heard so far involves a letter of no confidence from people that wouldn't have submitted them last time because you're not allowed to, or I mean, certainly the, the, the convention is that you're not allowed to submit a letter of no confidence, or indeed vote 
no confidence in the Prime Minister if you're a part of the government. So that's 15 more votes straight away. And then you've got these backbenchers, particularly the pungent 2019 dodos, who have finally broken cover and turned on Boris Johnson, to whom, of course, they owe their entire political careers. There's no earthly way any of those red wall seats would have fallen to the Conservative Party if it wasn't for Boris Johnson's blatant and barefaced lies about Brexit, and indeed his, his personal electoral cachet. So I don't think it's beyond the realms of possibility that Sir Graham Brady gets, I, I, I mean, ha more than half, gets letters of no confidence from more than half of the Parliamentary Conservative Party, in which case he goes to see Boris Johnson and simply says, it's over. And we can press ahead with the vote of no confidence if you want, but it would be damaging to the party's reputation because it would involve changing the rules in a way that is arguably a little bit um, sleight of hand. But this, this is the result. We already know the result because I've got more letters than you've got support. And that would be the metaphorical whiskey and revolver moment. The problem is, as we said at the very top of the programme, that previous prime ministers drink the metaphorical whiskey and then do the metaphorical decent thing with the revolver, Johnson would neck the booze and then shoot the chief whip. It's half past 11, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, a day on which quite possibly by tea time tonight, Boris Johnson will have fallen, which adds an extra layer, doesn't it, to the last two days that we've spent together, which have been unpinned, uh, underpinned by the question of how many times have we sat here and said, is he out, is, is it over now? Has he finally run out of road? So I've still got that little voice in the back of my head, a bit like Alistair Campbell's in the teams of Harwees, um, just saying, I, I, I don't, I, 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 just not necessarily count your chickens. Can we, um, can we get? Can you get wallpaper off the wall without damaging it? Can you use it? You can't recycle wallpaper, can you? How much was it a roll? The stuff that they they put on the walls in the Downing Street flat was it eight hundred quid a roll or something like that. Well, that's um, that's wasted, isn't it? Can we get? Can we get? Can you get like? I mean, do we need? I need to ring Gary, my mate Gary Burton, painter and decorator extraordinaire. There's no way you can get that stuff. Even the really posh stuff. Can you get the really posh? Should have used Velcro. They should have used Velcro. They should have used Velcro for the wallpaper. If you'd used Velcro, then you could have put it up wherever you're going to be pitching up next. God, even the, even that, the wallpaper, the flat, the money, the donor. You forgot about that as well, remember? Oh, I forgot about asking that guy to pay for my home decor. Because who wouldn't walk around a flat where you've, everything you see has been paid for by someone and forget who paid for it? and claiming yesterday that he'd forgotten about the conversation he'd had regarding Chris Pincher. Um, it's 11.34, PMQ's on the way, a, a particularly grim cavalcade of Tory faces all over your television. I won't bore you with any of their um, contributions unless they are exceptionally interesting. But I, 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 yeah, and I've seen this joke a lot as well. Paul Gascoigne's just turned up outside number 10 Downing Street with a fishing rod and three tins of lager. Very good. You must, you shouldn't try and pass those off as your own work. That's my job. I, I always admit when I'm stealing someone else's joke. That line about the revolver and the glass of whiskey, categorically not mine, for, 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 for example. But, um, but here we are. Has any journalist asked Sahar, we point blank, did you threaten to resign unless you were given the Chancellor's job? Asked Dave. Yeah, I think I think Kay Burley did this morning, actually. But Chris Mason, the BBC's political editor, got the um, got the apology last night. And the, the, what's fascinating about this is the speed with which they've gone from claiming, I know nothing. I know nothing. I'm from Barcelona. I know nothing. To saying, yep, yeah, absolutely out of order. Really, well, you hear what he had to say last night. Prime Minister, do you accept it was a grave error to appoint Chris Pincher to your government? Yes, I think it was a mistake and I apologise for, uh, for it. I think in, in, in hindsight it was uh, the wrong thing to do. Uh, I apologise to everybody who's been uh, badly affected by it. And I just want to make absolutely clear that there's no place in this government for uh, anybody who uh, is predatory or who uh, abuses their position of power. Did you want to joke though, pincher by name, pincher by nature? Well, what I can tell you is that uh, if I look at the background of this and why I regret it so much, is that uh, about three years ago, uh, there was a complaint made against uh, Chris Pincher in the Foreign Office. Uh, the complaint was, was uh, cleared up, he apologised, uh, it was raised with me uh, in uh, orally, there was a, I, was, I was briefed on what had, had happened mm -hmm. and you know if, if I had my time again I would think back on it 
and uh, recognised that uh, he wasn't going to learn uh, any okay. lesson, he w and he wasn't going to to change. Um, refusing to answer, of course, whether or not he had um, done that very characteristic sounding quip, pincher by name, pincher by nature, and also proving that he's a liar, again, because uh, the claim earlier was that he knew absolutely nothing about any of these allegations at all, and then that he knew nothing about any specific allegations, and then finally an admission that he had actually been briefed after all about substantiated allegations, which is what Simon McDonald's letter introduced to the public space yesterday. But if it, listen, I, I, mean, I know what you're thinking, his pants are on fire. They are absolutely blazing. I've never seen pants aflame in quite such a fashion as Boris Johnson's pants are currently burning, but you're wrong because... Do you believe that the Prime Minister is honest all the time, Mr Zahawi? Yes, I do. Um, and 11.37, Home Office Minister Victoria Atkins, who I think might technically fall under the Ministry of Justice these days, except she doesn't, because she's just resigned. So that brings the total of resignations from government. There's some miscalculation here because you're including letters of no confidence submitted by... Uh, backbenchers who don't have a role in government, so even being the trade envoy to Morocco counts as a government role, you now have, I think, 16 since 6 o'clock last night, and PMQs doesn't start for 20 minutes. Whew! Um, 03456060973 is the number you need. If you want to accept an invitation that I issue every day, and I do issue it in good faith, and I don't know how long I'm going to be issuing it for, well, this week, only two more days, because I'm off on holiday at the weekend for a fortnight. Um, I bet he's gone by then. It could be gone by the end of this programme, but I think it's more likely he'll be gone by the end of the week, or indeed the end of the day. I, 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 I offer this, and I know sometimes you think I don't mean it, but I really do. If you just want to call in and say, that's it for me now, I, I can't... And, and the more loyal you were, even if you were one of those people who used to send me messages saying, you love it because I'm so upset by this, and I'd say, but I'm upset because it's our country that's being ruined by these clowns. And you'd say, yeah, I love it, it's great, ha, ha, ha. Um, oh, you, 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 I love it, I love it, oh, it's great. If you were like that, and you finally, as I knew you would... I don't, I'm not being patronising, you have to. There is truth and there is untruth. And if you can hold on to the truth, even if you are the only one, you will not go mad. It's been a great comfort to me, that line from George Orwell. But it won't be much comfort to you, because you were holding on to the untruth. Have you finally let go? I'd love to talk to you if that's it now. You've, you've realised, God, what? Because what I'd like you to do is answer the question, what was I thinking? I'd love to know. I, I wanted to know then, when you were still aboard the, the bandwagon, and I'd love to know now, this enormous Boris Johnson bandwagon with all sorts of lies plastered on the side of it. We don't even mention the 350 million quid for the NHS anymore. Lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. And there you were, in, 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 in the box seat, banging along on this sharabank of corruption, refusing to contemplate the possibility that you were complicit in something truly disgusting, something damaging the very heart of British democracy. And now you see that you were. What were you thinking? Give me a call and tell me. 0345 you You've seen the light. You've let go. And you've asked yourself, what the hell was I thinking? I'd love to know what answer you come up with. Because if the answer is Brexit, I've got some horrible news for you. You're not even out of the woods yet. Alice is in Northwich in Cheshire. Alice, what would you like to say? What's going on? Why are they doing it now? Oh, well, I mean, they're doing it now entirely out of self-interest. Um, <laughs> they're not entirely. How can they be doing it entirely out of self-interest and staying entirely out of self-interest as well? Well, it's different judgments, isn't it? Yeah, I suppose it is. Is there no yeah, one nice? But, but Johnson is going to cling on with his fingernails. I, I can't see him um, being prepared to suffer the ignominy of, um, of the 22 committee um, chucking him out. No. So I, I think if, because as you've always said, you know, it's it's Johnson first, you know. Um, so I think if push comes to shove, I think he could actually call a general election. You mean as in a cornered rat is at its most dangerous and yeah. will do absolutely anything, even pick a fight with a with a with a with a you know a terrier if it yeah. if, if it's cornered. Would he be allowed to do that? I mean, I know that technically the Queen is a, allowed to decline a Prime Minister's request for a general election. I don't think she would. But I don't think she would either. I mean, crikey, the poor woman is absolutely shattered at the moment as well. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. the last thing you'd need. Although Johnson wouldn't 
take that into any of his calculations. He was happy to send Jacob rees to Balmoral to lie to her. Mm. So I, that, I know, it's just... Um, I was amazed that they um, got away with that in the first place. Just, someone mentioned yeah, that the other day. Everybody thought the Queen had more... Um, the authority. Well, I mean, they've all got pictures of her on their wall. Do you remember oh, when everyone, <laughs> when every time they gave an interview, they were competing Absolutely. to see who could have the biggest flag and the most pictures of the Queen on the wall? And yeah. I wonder if they stopped doing that after they sent Boris uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg to Scotland to mislead her about the illegal oh, prorogation. I so. <laughs> that would probably be why, why it was. <laughs> well, I never. So, I, well, I hope you're wrong, obviously, but um. But there we are. The, the idea that he might, that, that I, as an act of abject desperation, call some sort of general election and say, all right, I've completely lost the support of my party, but the British public still want me and I'm going to prove it. But, but who, I mean, how can you even stand in a general election as an MP in a party led by someone who you've publicly disowned or publicly condemned? What a mess. I wonder whether we're knocking at the door of having to say out loud that even those of us who predicted a mess like we had never seen before didn't, didn't actually fully predict the scale of the mess that we're seeing. That would be something, wouldn't it? Thank you, Alice. Peter is in Clydebank. Peter, what would you like to say? Good morning, Jane. Hello, Peter. Uh, I, I want to expand on the one of your callers saying about the Honiton and Tiverton election. Yes, result. yes. I think that opens up to the Tory party the fear of the anti-Boris vote. Well, there's an element, maybe a soft Tory element, mm. that we normally vote Tory but will not vote for Boris. And it also shows that Labour supporters are prepared to abandon their principles and vote for any other candidate that can win. And if you do the maths, it's very possible there'll be a coalition government and it won't involve the Tories at the next election. If you get a coalition government, there's got to be a strong possibility of proportional representation. And that would pretty much keep the Tories out of power for whoever knows. Do you know so, some, someone a, suggested yeah, that to trying to pick the next Tory leader is like trying to pick which toilet to go to at Glastonbury? Yes. Did you see that? Yes. I, th I think that's a magnificent but, but, line. No, no, but what, what I would say is, and I've grown up under Thatcher, and I hated her policies, mm. But you thought she was you thought she had morality and ethics and yeah. you thought she was doing what she believed was right for the country. Yeah. Same with Major, same with Cameron, same with me. Not with this man. No, and clearly that's not. The difference. That's so whoever the difference. they replace him with is going to be at least yeah. sellable as someone who's not it, completely corrupt. It softens the soft the to, the soft sort of Tory vote. There'll always be a clear Tory vote that will vote for Tories. But there's a soft Tory vote that maybe switch here and there or not vote at all. Mm. And they will come back into the fold if it's anyone other than Boris. But I think PR's the big spectre. If we get to a, an election and the Tories don't get an overall majority, then PR certainly could be on the table. And then you'll never get an overall majority for the Tories. I can't see how no, I mean, and that there is an existential threat to the to, to the Conservative Party if if PR is brought in by a, by by a Labour government because it would be coalition government forevermore, but but a coalition that is highly unlikely ever to involve the Conservative Party. So he could kill the Conservative Party and kill the Union, of course, and uh, kill off the United Kingdom by having to wave goodbye to Northern Ireland, all as a consequence of Brexit. I do wonder, and we're going to have to do a phone in on it probably when I get from holiday. How many people realise that all of this is a direct consequence of, of the lies upon which Brexit was built and the doubling down upon those lies that constituted the 2019 election? Because, I mean, and in fact, it's not me that needs to prove that. You've already admitted it yourself, not, not Peter, but people who thought that this was good for the country looked upon the 2019 election as a, as a doubling down on the mandate for Brexit. And look what you've done. Look what you've done. I hope you take a moment to reflect upon this. You've let yourselves down, you've let your family down, and you've let your country down. And I'm afraid those of us who told you what you were doing, I think we deserve a little bit more respect and gratitude, quite frankly, and a very good place to start would be Twitter. Apologies, please, to at Mr. James O'B. PMQs is almost upon us. Um, Keir Starmer, when he gets to his feet in a House of Commons that at the moment, with about 10 minutes on the clock, is very, very sparsely populated on the government benches. I mean, hardly anybody, in fact, on, on, on the government. Well, that's not true at the back, but the Labour, as you'd expect, benches are absolutely rammed. 
and the government benches are, uh, I mean, close to empty. A bit like the cabinet. Very much an Ikea... Well, now, it's not fair on Ikea. Someone's just tweeted a joke about it's an Ikea cabinet now. It'll fall apart very quickly. But I find Ikea furniture, if you put it together properly, um, very, very sturdy. And, and it lasts for a very long time. They wouldn't have dominated the market in the way that they have done. I love the idea of someone just tuning in now and thinking, why is Alan Partridge on the radio talking about Ikea cabinets at the time of probably the biggest political crisis since the last one because we forget don't we i mean theresa may um uh, david cameron all of the disastrous uh, votes on brexit and what have you and of course we also forget that a lot of people will not be ready yet to admit that the awfulness of boris johnson is an inevitable consequence of the awfulness of brexit because there'll still be as these resignation letters prove claiming that getting brexit done has a happened and b was a good thing to happen anyway. Here is the stupidest man in Parliament, um, Lee Anderson, speaking to the BBC a few moments ago. Uh, look, I've been a, a massive supporter of the boss since I got elected here in 2019. Mm. I think he's got all the big calls right, he got Brexit done, I think it was very good through the pandemic, you know, really, really good uh, through the Ukraine war, but this last incident over the past week has, has, has really done it for me. Um, I cannot accept um, some of the stories coming out of number 10. It's not just about the Prime Minister, it's the old number 10, the operation, how we get our comms so wrong, there's denials and then admissions, and I'm gutted for the Prime Minister because I think he's done a great job and I'm, I'm a massive supporter of him, but at the end of the day, we can't allow this sort of stuff to go on. Thick as mince, seriously, 30p mince, actually, value mince, call it what you will mince, absolutely incredible. He's done a great job. He's done a great job. I mean, I think that... Crikey, you give your head a wobble, isn't it? even strong enough to describe what that fella needs to do to himself. But that is absolutely incredible. He's done a great job. He got Brexit done. Seeing where the pound is today, seeing where the labour market is today, see what's going on with the economy today, see what the GDP is doing today, see what the OBR forecasts are today. Yeah, it's a great job. Well done, Brexit. And if you build an entire administration upon lies, it will eventually fall apart. And yet someone like Lee Anderson till stu too stupid even to see the lies that are right under his nose. 11.51 is the time. Glenn is in stroke on Trent. Glenn, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello. How are you? I'm all right, mate. What's uh, on your mind? Well, I'm just sitting back and uh, smiling to myself because I go back to, well, way before he was the mayor and, 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 and how people didn't realise then he was um, an habitual liar, you know, with the, the tape recording of... Um, when he was going to have that journalist beaten up. Um, yeah, it's you know, a fair it's point. I'd, I'd like to uh, argue with you, but I don't think I can. I mean, there, there were lots of things that should have undermined that ebullient, yeah. buffoonish bonhomie that he betrayed on the telly, weren't there? But we, we didn't. I didn't. Yeah. And it's just it's just gone on from there. Uh, and uh, I sort of smiled to myself this morning that when I saw that uh, the local MP, our local MP, Jonathan Gullies, who's been four square behind Johnson, uh, has also, you know, jumped the the uh, sinking ship. Yes. Uh, and, and another one, uh, as you've just said, is another one who, to me, is as thick as a whale omelette. Um, <laughs> he, he just... Um, it's your neck of the woods, though, isn't it? Uh, Gullis's constituency, exactly. as yeah, you mentioned. Yeah. So what about this tension, which I think we'll probably be talking about a lot in the weeks to come, once Johnson has gone. What about the tension between getting rid of him isn't going to suddenly make Brexit yeah. something that was a good idea? Stoke was quite a big Brexit-supporting town, I think. City. Well, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't one of them. Right. Um, but I mean, I, I go back to, and I, I don't know whether it was your analogy or I heard it on the on your show yeah. about the um, getting the UK out of the EU was like taking the egg out of a cake. It was mine actually. Uh, that actually. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's and even in my book, so I can prove it. I've got I've got a copyright on that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the book as well, so yeah. Probably. Um, I, I, I think that analogy now is also very useful for the Tory party, whereas the Tory party's the cake and Johnson's the rotten egg mm. that has gone into the cake and if you take Johnson out, the, the rotten egg is still in there. So I think whichever way they jump now, whether they resign or whether they don't, I think the only way they're going to clean up the Tory party is throwing that cake away uh, and making another one. Do, do uh, you, you do, so, I mean, the calculation clearly... And in some ways, if you were a died-in-the-world Tory supporter, your perspective, and indeed my perspective, would be more interesting than, than those of us who are sort of watching it all fall apart with a modicum of 
satisfaction underpinned of course and you say you're sitting there smiling but it is our country that's on fire even if well, it, that's if, right, if, yeah. if you, but but you you don't think that they will be able to shrug off the association that, that, that when johnson's gone they'll dust themselves up the ones that are employable in in cabinet or ministerial roles will just pretend it never happened and they completely ignore the stench and trust that voters will too i, I think i i'm probably a bit more cynical than you i i i, I Oh, no, we're equally cynical. You you think they won't be able to do that? No, no I think they'll try. But yeah, they'll I just try. Think, I just think that, <laughs> that that stench is there and it won't go away. What about the ones who've jumped first, the, the, the Javids and the Sunaks? Do they get it? I, I think they do because, you know, they, they've been a, they've been part and parcel That's of all the point, this. That's uh, They're absolutely, this absolutely uh, part and parcel of it. So I, I don't think any of them are immune. They, you know, it's it's like they've got the cold water on, and when they broke into a safe, it's, it doesn't go away, does it? Indeed, it doesn't. And that, I mean, that is the key question, isn't it? And that's why I, I am going to have to find ways of tempting traditional Tory voters on onto the programme. I, I want to speak to you if you've seen the light. I'm, I'm not going to apologise for that phraseology now. I'm not. Not, uh, I've been very, very polite. Content for the con, men, compassion for the con. You've seen what he is now. If you're still clinging to the idea that he's anything other than what I've been telling you for the best part of a decade, then I'm afraid you're 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 a complete cult, and there's absolutely nothing I can do to help you. I've done it, I've tried, and he's now proved it. So if you're still there, uh, I, I back Boris. Hashtag something. Then I, I I'm really sorry for you, and especially for your loved ones and your family, because. You must be going through hell while pretending that everything's actually going swimmingly. And, and that is awful. It's an awful position that he's put in, but my sympathy is now exhausted.